Okay, we are online. Second talk on the subject of the conference is now. Jesper, please. All right. Thanks a lot for, for letting me give a talk at this very nice workshop. Um, I'm very happy to be here virtually and um, to be able to present some of some of our, our work. Uh, now, I, I'm not really used to giving talks around get, as it's getting close to midnight. So, um, you know, if, if I start suddenly not making any sense, please let me know and I'll try and wake up. So anyway, okay, so um, so I want to switch gears now and, uh, well, I'll still talk about impurities in quantum gases, but I'll be focusing on the Fermi Polaron problem. And, uh, oops, so I'll be imagining that we have a, a Fermi gas, like this blue blob here, characterized by some Fermi energy, and I have a single impurity in the system here. And now, of course, the question is, as you know, many of us are working on what happens when we have interactions between this impurity and this Fermi gas. Yeah. Um, and this is, of course, a very fundamental problem in physics that arises in, in systems from, you know, neutron stars where you have protons uh, immersed in, in among neutrons. And you can think of these as some polarons in this problem. And of course, um, all the way to cold gases, or, or for instance, very recently also um, to uh, try and understand uh, absorption peaks in, in semiconductors, in doped semiconductors, where you again have these kind of attractive and repulsive branches um, when you have an exciton that interacts with electrons. So this is quite um, a generic problem and uh, of, of very broad interest. Um, of course, from the point of view of this talk here, uh, I'll be focused on focusing on uh, the cold atom system, where we have a bunch of controlled um, experiments in the system here. So this list here is getting longer and longer every time I give this talk, at least these days with COVID, where I'm not giving so many talks. Um, and and um, so we, we can, investigate this concept of quasi-particles in, in a very kind of controlled setting where we really have control over the interactions, the densities, the dimensionalities, uh, and the temperature. So this is all very important. So this is an outline of the talk. Um, so I want to discuss two different types of probes of the system. Um, I'll talk about RF spectroscopy, which is usually used to, to measure the, the spectrum in the system. And then I'll be talking about um, continuous rapid driving of a, an impurity. Um, and this leads me to address two different questions about the nature of the Fermi polaron. And one question I want to look at is what is the evolution of the system with temperature? Um, and the other question I want to look at is uh, what is the lifetime of the repulsive polaron? Um, okay, so let me start. So I'm imagining really that we have a single impurity here in a Fermi gas. And now there are two different experimental protocols that are typically uh, carried out in these systems here. There's either injection where I go from the non-interacting system here to the interacting system here, where you know this impurity can, for instance, repel or attract all these uh, background atoms, or I can talk about ejection spectroscopy, um, where I go from this interacting state to the non-interacting state, and I have this RF pulse that drives this transition either one direction or another direction, and this transfer rate as a function of the frequency gives you your uh, impurity spectral function. And, and typically this is a momentum averaged in, in experiment. Now, the first result I want to give, which is actually very generic, it does not depend on the medium. It only depends on the fact that we have a single impurity in thermal equilibrium with the medium. Um, oops. Okay, uh, it's late. I'm forgetting what, where I'm going. Okay, so maybe let me first show these kind of spectra, this injection spectrum here from uh, the group at Innsbruck, 
where they measured the attractive polar end branch and the repulsive polar end branch, like this here, and the continuum of states in between. Now, uh, there have also recently been uh, experiments on the ejection spectrum uh, in the group of Martin Svealain. Um, and there they were focusing, for instance, at unitarity, they were measuring the, the spectrum as a function of temperature here. And they found this peculiar kind of behavior as a function of temperature where uh, the peak kind of shifted um, as a function of temperature when you cross TF roughly. So I mean, could you please yes. uh, detail what, uh, what is measured precisely in the experiment? Aha, okay. So, um, so this essentially these experiments are carried out in the linear response regime. So, um, so this energy here is, is the energy difference uh, between the, uh, measured, the energy measured from the bare frequency of the transition between this hyperfine state here. So this spin down and spin up is that's typically two different hyperfine states of atoms. Um, so for instance, two different hyperfine states of lithium. And so they have a bare transition and now there's this transition frequencies um, is essentially shifted uh, in the presence of interactions. So for instance, in this case here, I have attractive interactions between my impurity and, uh, and my fermions here. And that means that as I try to inject into this system here, I need to have less energy um, in order to do that. So that's when I see this attractive branch here. And I can also be in a state where this impurity effectively repels the, the fermions, and that's this repulsive branch here. Yeah, and, the, that... color, and the color code is the intensity of what? Yes, yes. So this is, this is just the, um, well, the strength of the linear response. So it's, it's like a, just as, you know, uh, you get some sort of more or less Gaussian signal out or Lorentzian shape out. And uh, it's, it's simply the spectral weight. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's the absorption, right? It's the absorption thing, was it? Yes, yes, this is absorption, yes. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is kind of akin to photoluminescence, although it's not entirely the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is the advertised uh, first result that I wanted to, to uh, mention here. Um, if I have a single impurity, and if I assume that this single impurity is in equilibrium with the medium, in a sense, uh, in the sense that, for instance, in the in this scenario here, I'm assuming I start from a non-interacting impurity with the medium, but there's still weak enough interactions that that my my uh, distribution of, of uh, momentum is set by the the temperature of this medium here. So that's what I mean by the single impurity limit in the sense you can think of it as a Boltzmann gas of impurities, completely uncorrelated impurities. So if I have this limit, then I actually have a relationship between the injection spectrum and the ejection spectrum. Um, so it's, I have a flipped frequency. I have a prefactor that depends on, on the, the frequency relative to the temperature. And then I have a factor here, this prefactor here that involves the difference in free energy between these two scenarios. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Uh, I, sure. I somehow got lost. Uh, what's the difference between injection and injection since uh, you simply drive uh, the impurity back and forth by... by uh -huh. Aha, okay. So, so here I'm, I'm really imagining that I, uh, I look I, I start in this situation. So in experiment, they can start simply in this situation here. And now I, I start driving it. And you're of course right, if I, if I keep driving the system, then I will go back and forth. But here is just a short pulse and I'm just looking in the linear response regime. Uh, and I, I'm looking at the linear you. response of the system. Thank you. To a weak pulse. Okay. Yes, so this is, this theory here is also within linear response. I have this re uh, relationship here between my ejection and my injection spectroscopy. And as I was trying to say before, actually this is a very generic result 
which is valid for any kind of medium, bosonic medium, fermionic medium, or it can even be, you know, an impurity immersed in a BCS to BC kind of crossover, superfluid. Okay, so, so these two spectroscopies that were thought of previously as uh, really distinct, they're actually related by this relationship here as long as I can consider my impurities to be completely non-correlated. So as I said, this free energy that appears here is really just, a, this is the free energy of the interacting system and this F naught here is the free energy of the non-interacting system. So it's, it's a property of the single impurity in some sense. Okay, and this free energy here, we can arrive at in, in many different ways. For instance, what we can use is, we can use the fact that we have a sum rule of the injection spectrum, that the integral of all frequencies here gives you one. And then we can relate this free energy simply to an integral over the ejection spectrum like this. So if you have a theoretical method that can calculate this and we can predict the free energy. Um, and also this free energy here is um, actually something that can be measured in experiment by simply looking at the ratio of um, transitions mm -hmm. within this linear response regime between the ejection and the injection kind of protocols. And for instance, at zero frequency, I can look at, I can derive the free, uh, free energy from the ratio of these two um, responses. So, okay. So let me now define a little bit more what uh, what this injection and ejection spectroscopy is. So this ejection spectroscopy is where I'm going from the interacting to the non-interacting. I can think of this as, let me take an impurity of momentum P here, and I now drive it at frequency omega relative to the bad transition. This gives me a rate here uh, as a function of P and omega. And now I sum over all possible momenta, and that gives me the total transition rate. Now, on the other hand, when I inject the system, uh, sorry, when I when I inject my impurity, sorry, is a question. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So when I inject from here to here, uh, on the other hand, then I will assume now that my impurity here has, like I said, this Boltzmann distribution of its momentum, like this here. And this is just the partition function of the, of the impurity. So just to sum over P of this guy here. Um, uh, and sorry, then I- this, this is a bit uh, confusing. Why, why don't you assume that the, uh, so if in the ejection case, why don't you assume that the impurity is Boltzmann distributed according to the- ah. So in the ejection case, the impurities momentum distribution is given by the interactions with the medium, right? So, so it's- Oh, it is dominated by the interactions with the medium. And yes, yes. Okay, so there is a contribution, there is a Boltzmann contribution, but you can neglect it, is that what you're saying? Um, well, uh, so in that sense, so of course, the medium has a thermal distribution yes, yes. and this affects how, how the momentum distribution is of the impurity, but um, you know, uh, but it, this depends on the strength of the interactions and okay. so on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the, the point is that these two rates here, these two spectral functions, ejection and injection spectral functions, they can be calculated within linear response theory and maybe I don't want to go through all of this here, um, but this is just standard Fermi golden rule type calculation. Um, but now when you go through and, and, you, um, and you compare these two equations here, uh, taking into account the fact that we have this um, uh, energy conservation in the problem, then you precisely find that there's a relationship between your ejection spectrum and your injection spectrum like this here, the momentum result one. And what you find here is that you have this ratio of partition functions. So this partition function set medium here is a partition function of the medium in the absence of the impurity. 
Uh, this here is a partition function of the impurity only. And this here is of the interacting system. And this ratio here is precisely the uh, difference in free energy uh, exponentiated. Okay. And now, of course, when we now sum the, these, the two sides of this equation here, we precisely find this uh, relationship that I was advertising before. Okay, so you may also ask, uh, how does this relate to kind of usual detailed balance conditions that you may have? Because this looks and smells very much like a detailed balance condition. So what I want to say is that these are really, we should think of these as two different uh, experimental protocols. Uh, so we are really going from either, you know, a non-interacting impurity into an interacting impurity state or vice versa. So they're really two different protocols. Now, if we instead think about detailed balance uh, problems, then typically in uh, what we're looking at is the occupied versus the unoccupied parts of the impurity spectral function. So uh, typically detailed balance conditions are formulated as follows. So we assume that we have a finite density of impurities. And now, of course, once we have a finite density of these impurities, the uh, statistics matters. So we have either fermionic or bosonic impurities. So, and then you consider, for instance, just a spectral function of, let's say, uh, spin off type impurities. And then in general, the spectral function of these impurities here has two different parts. So it has a particle part and it has a whole part. So uh, an occupied part and an unoccupied part. And these are both found from the impurity Green's function. Um, and you have a detailed balance condition between this um, unoccupied part of the spectral function and the occupied part of the spectral function. So this is a typical detailed balance condition for this kind of problem. But now my point is that in the single impurity limit, if you wish, uh, in, the, in the limit where we work with a canonical ensemble of impurities and a grand canonical ensemble of the bath, um, then we need to actually um, take the limit of the chemical potential of the impurities going to minus infinity. So that means that the prefactor here goes to zero. And so we need to do something slightly different here. Effectively, if you want to take the single impurity limit of this kind of detailed balance condition, this corresponds to taking a virial expansion um, of, of your impurity kind of particles. So in this limit here, indeed you find this kind of, um, you find that these A plus and A minus here, they are related to the injection and the ejection spectrum, but there is this prefactor here, which goes to zero. So that's kind of a problem. But so, so this, what I want to say here is that this is really, it's akin to a detailed balance condition, but it's slightly different because we're really talking about these two different uh, protocols. Okay, so um, there are no questions on this, then maybe I will, uh, I will go on and talk about the other probe that I'll be considering in this talk. And uh, this is that of Rabi oscillations. So before what I was thinking about was linear response um, going from one state to another or you know, vice versa. But here, what I'm thinking about is a stronger drive and a continuous drive, okay? Between these two different uh, scenarios, either the non-interacting impurity or the interacting impurity. Now, this has been carried out in, in several experiments now, both in Innsbruck and at Lenz and uh, at LMU in Munich. Um, and this here is, is one of the uh, figures from the Florence group. Um, and so here what they measure is um, in the absence of, um, of any interactions, they measure these very nice kind of Rabi oscillations that are essentially undamped these gray uh, symbols here. But now once you have interactions in the system, 
actually you find that you get kind of these damped oscillations now. And as you go to stronger and stronger interactions, these oscillations become more and more damped. And also what you see is actually even the Rabi frequency changes. So you, the drive is kept the same for all of these experimental realizations, but actually the effective Rabi frequency changes here as, um, as a function of the interaction strength. And this can be explained by the following kind of very simple observation that essentially the, um, we have a difference between the kind of non-interacting state or this state over here and the interacting state here. And this, so, so they have a, a, a finite overlap, which is different from one, which is called the residue. And this uh, Rabi frequency here is sort of renormalized by that residue now. And so that's what leads to this uh, change in the frequency here. Um, so you can really think of this scenario here as, as coupling two different spectral functions. We're coupling like the non-interacting impurity with just a bare peak in the spectrum with an interacting impurity, which has some features in the spectral function. And for instance, it has a, um, a repulsive polarant peak with a certain width and a certain energy. And so we can ask questions uh, like, in, in these Rabi oscillations here, can we learn something about this peak here? And it turns out that indeed we can, because this sort of uh, damped uh, oscillations that we see here actually can be described as this damped exponential, which comes from the width of this peak that we're, we're Sorry, I should say that there's a detuning in the system here and we can set the detuning such that the Rabi drive is directly coupling this energy here with this energy here. And that's, that's the scenario we are imagining. And then we have this, damp, uh, this oscillation here where the oscillation frequency is given by this uh, uh, modified kind of frequency. Sorry, what if, what if uh, the... Uh, the value under square root is negative. Ah, yes. Okay. So then eventually if, if this peak here becomes too wide or, or this residue becomes too low, which is typically in the same regime, then essentially you lose coherent oscillations. And, and this, this here is, of course, this is an approximation um, <clears throat> and this approximation breaks down. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now finally I'll come to how we model these kind of things. Um, so like I said, uh, what we're going to do is we're working in a canonical ensemble of the impurity, single impurity, with some kinetic energy um, and these operators here. We have this medium here at a chemical potential mu. And what I'll be working with uh, is a two channel model, um, which describes the interaction between this impurity and a fermion through the formation of this closed channel molecule. And well, of course, back out again. And this closed channel molecule has a certain dispersion and detuning. So this is a convenient way of describing fastback resonant interactions where we have a, a scattering length and an effective range. And because I'll be modeling also 2D experiments, uh, it can serve as an approximation of a, uh, uh, quasi two dimensional scattering. So for instance, in three dimensions, um, this kind of model here, this kind of interaction can describe this, can be described uh, by this kind of scattering amplitude where we have both a scattering uh, length and a range parameter, which is proportional to the effective range. And these parameters can be related to uh, the bare parameters of the model. Um, okay, so now we want to describe kind of spectroscopy or dynamics. So um, what we've developed uh, in order to take into account also temperature in the system is a time-dependent variational approach for an arbitrary state of the Fermi gas. And um, like Mira was describing in the previous talk, um, 
we like to write down wave functions for our systems, so effective kind of variational wave functions. But it turns out that at finite temperature, actually, it's, it's better to work with uh, variational operators than wave functions. And this is because working with operators allows us to separate out the, the sort of thermal average um, um, from the impurity dynamics. So anyway, so, so the type of variational operators that we're working with here um, take this form here. So what I'm imagining is that I have my bare impurity with some coefficient here. Um, I have a term here where my bare impurity has created one particle hole pair. So that's kind of this illustration here that my impurity knocks a particle out of the, um, of the Fermi C. And then this term here is needed because I have this uh, closed channel. Now, the way to um, go from a, an operator to some equations that we can actually work with is to, to do the following. So we define another operator, which is we call an error operator because it's an error incurred for this variational operator here in the Heisenberg equation of motion. So of course, the right-hand side here is precisely the Heisenberg equation of motion. So we know that this here should actually be zero, but because we truncate this operator here at this level here, it means that actually this is non-zero, this right-hand side. And now we can calculate an error quantity in this system here, which comes from uh, taking the trace over this error operator here, evaluated with respect to the, the medium. So that's how we treat the temperature. Uh, 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 yes, per, uh, tef, yeah. I, I'm a bit lost in terms of uh, operators. So C is yes. uh, impu up and down, okay? This is the impurity. And we are Very imagining good. that we have both states up and state down. For instance, for the Rabi oscillations, this is very okay, important. So it's an impurity in two models. internal states. So impurity can't mm -hmm. be converted to gas. So impurity is in two internal states, right? Yes. Good. Uh, so then there are F, which are fermions eventually. Yes. And there is a D I lost. Yes. So this. D uh, maybe just forget about D. If we just, oh. you know, we, we could have written just a model with uh, C dagger C, F dagger F instead of this thing here, uh, which would be, you know, so-called single channel model, just usual kind of point-like interactions. Uh, then we wouldn't have this effect to range here and we wouldn't have this term here. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's just so we can take into account uh, more aspects of the scattering. So this is just a, a close. Uh, so D, D, D are fermions in D, D, D wave, uh, right? D, D is the molecule that is formed from a fermion, fermion. And, and your impurity. Ah. And it is effectively a fermionic operator because you only have one impurity. So if you have two of those D operators uh, together, they, they you know, uh, give you zero. Sorry. Anyway, so this here, is, you should think of this as a, a close, it's a molecule formed from the impurity and the fermion. And this is how they interact by forming a molecule and going back out from each other. Does that make sense? Maybe. So what I, have I lost everyone? Uh, no. No, okay, very good. Uh, okay. So um, what I should say is that this approach here is, is exact at short times compared to the Fermi time or in the high temperature limit. But from, from numerous kind of um, uh, tests of this theory uh, compared with, uh, for instance, numerically exact uh, methods for an infinitely heavy impurity and so on, we find that it's actually extremely good up to you know, 20, 30 times the Fermi time. So it's at up to quite long times. Um, so it's a very good approximation of the dynamics in the system. 
Okay, so the first question that I want to address using this kind of theory is exactly these kind of thermodynamic uh, variables that I was um, alluding to before, like the free energy difference between the interacting and non-interacting state or the contact, which comes from the derivative of the free energy. So um, there were recent experiments at uh, MIT measuring this contact here. So this is a contact measured at unitarity. So I have one over A is zero, uh, where A is the impurity fermion scattering length. And what they found was that they found this non-monotonic dependence uh, on the temperature. So that's these red dots here. And so this blue line here is our theory. And as you can see, it, it actually works extremely well. It gets all the features right. It gets more or less the maximum of this peak right. It, uh, it's like I said, it's exact in the high temperature limit and it also gets low temperature limit quite spot on. Um, and associated with this, we've calculated this free energy here, which hasn't been measured in the experiment, but like I said, can in principle be measured from the, from the spectrum itself. So, and, and that also has this uh, non-monotonic behavior. So, and, and as, as a reference here, I've also plotted the infinitely heavy impurity case, which is this black line. And there we can calculate the, the result exactly. That's this, this line here. And our, our calculation, numerical calculation with this variational approach I just talk, told you about are these uh, boxes here. So we see that there is some difference for an infinitely heavy impurity. But this is to be expected because the inf infinitely heavy impurity is sort of a worst case scenario where we have the orthogonality catastrophe, which cannot be described by this variational approach. So we expect to have some difference in that case. And indeed we do. Okay, so now let me explain why we think there could be a non-monotonic dependence on temperature. Actually, it turns out that this is a signature of, of the, uh, the underlying spectrum in the following sense. So the contact is, it comes from the derivative of the free energy. So if I sit at zero temperature, this derivative is completely dominated by this ground state here, okay? So I have a contact that's just uh, determined by the, the slope at this point here. Now, as I increase temperature, I actually, so this here is this attractive polar on. Um, as I increase temperature, I, I start to access this continuum of states, this molecule whole continuum that exists at higher energies, okay? And this molecule whole continuum will eventually go down and actually cross the, this attractive polar on, and it will become the ground state here. So that means that it has a higher slope than my ground state. And so at finite temperature, I start to populate these states here. And that's why initially the contact goes up in this regime here. Now, eventually, of course, we know that, that quantum correlations have to completely vanish at very high temperatures. So eventually it has to go down, but it explains why we would have a peak in this function here. And it's really, in some sense, we can view it as a signature of this underlying phase transition or single particle phase transition, uh, polar on molecule transition at this point here, simply because we can see that this, this uh, continuum has quite a, a much higher slope than our ground state. And indeed, um, if we look at the temperature evolution, um, now, as a function of scattering length, so before I was looking at unitarity, so I was looking at scattering length zero. Um, now I'm looking as a function of scattering length on the repulsive, uh, on the, sorry, on the positive scattering length side. And here, um, I have two different contacts at zero temperature. So that's this black line here. I have the contact that's associated with the attractive polar on here. And then I have the contact that's associated uh, with the molecule here. 
And those contacts, of course, come from this polaron molecule transition here, where first I have the polaron is a ground state until here. And then after this, the molecule becomes a ground state. So it has a higher contact. Right. Now, as I increase the temperature to 0.1 or 0.2 TF, which are these red or blue dots here, I see that, you know, for instance, the free energy here actually goes down. Um, but what's perhaps more interesting here is that I see that actually um, the contact starts to behave in a non monotonic fashion close to this transition point here. So I see that indeed. Um, in this regime close to unitarity, the contact goes up with temperature from 0 to 0.1 to 0.2, black to red to blue. Whereas over here, I see that it's going down with temperature. And so at some point around here, I, I must have uh, something non monotonic happening. Okay. And so that you can really think of this uh, non monotonic behavior of the contact as a signature of the underlying physics. Now we can also compare our results with the recent ex experiments at Technion uh, in the group of Yoav Saki. And um, here, if we plot this contact as a function of, of inverse scattering length, um, the results do quite good until we start to zoom in um, by kind of subtracting the leading order of the contact. And then we see that there's quite a strong difference between our results and the experiment results. So this would require some, some work, presumably, uh, well, you all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm guessing if we could have a box trap for this kind of experiment, and if we could magically measure the temperature, uh, then, then that would probably be the ideal scenario for, for measuring this. Um, okay. Okay, so um, now what we can also compare with is an exact calculation for the case of an infinitely heavy impurity. And I was already showing one line from this exact calculation before. So in that case, well, once again, the contact comes from the derivative of the free energy. And now by the Hellman Feynman theorem, we can find this as, uh, you know, the the expectation value of the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to this one on A. And because this inverse scattering length is directly, um, well, any change in one on A is directly given by a change in this detuning between the open and closed channels that I had before. Actually, I can evaluate this um, just by looking at my Hamiltonian, I can find this derivative. So this gives me the expectation value of, um, of just closed channel molecules, uh, the number operator of the closed channel molecule. So this is similar to um, um, operator product expansions. Anyway, now what I can do is I can use the analytic solution of the impurity fermion two-body problem to actually um, calculate this trace here. Okay, and if I do that, then I find this result here for the contact. Um, so what I what do I have? Well, I have one term here, which is given by the Fermi Dirac distribution of the medium times the scattering amplitude squared. And so this gives me one term in the contact. And then I have another term, which only comes from the bound state. Uh, so that's just a contribution of that single state. And, um, and now from this contact here, uh, which is exact in the system here, I can calculate the free energy. And the free energy is given now because it's, the contact is a derivative of free energy. I can go the other way around. I can integrate from the non-interacting limit to a given scattering length. And what do I find? Well, I find that the difference in free energies is given by this integral here of the Fermi Dirac distribution times the scattering phase shift, the S wave scattering phase shift. And this here is precisely um, the same as, as Fumi's 
theorem um, for an infinitely heavy impurity in a, in a Fermi gas, which is usually formulated as zero temperature. So I've actually never seen this in any paper. I've do, done a lot of searching around for Fumi's theorem at finite temperature, uh, but, but anyway, here it is. And then again, we have this contribution from the, from the bound state. So um, now what I can do is uh, I can directly calculate this, for instance, at unitarity, I can find that uh, the free entity takes this kind of simple form here in terms of the fugacity of the medium. And um, I can also calculate the contact exactly, uh, for instance, at unitarity is this line here, um, which also takes a nice closed analytic form. So in the case of the infinitely heavy impurity, we can get some really uh, nice uh, results for these quantities. So um, maybe I'll just stop briefly here and ask if there are any questions on this. So yes, yeah, so quick question. Uh, why now you don't see any non-monotonicity non in temperature dependence of the contact? Ah, yes, this was definitely on my list of things to say, and I'm, I'm just tired. Um, so, so the reason is that, um, sorry, in the, actually, let me, here. The reason is that in, in the case of, of equal masses, like what I was, as, yes, in the case of equal masses, I had this kind of, um, let me call it a single impurity phase diagram. So it's really that I have this attractive branch here and I have this continuum here where I actually have a transition in the ground state where the impurity binds one particle and becomes a dressed uh, dimer particle in the system, okay? This transition no longer exists in the case of an infinitely heavy impurity. In some sense, uh, in that case, um, you're always in this continuum kind of scenario. You, you never have a well-defined quasi-particle. That's the Anderson orthogonality catastrophe. So in some sense, this gray branch here does not exist. And, uh, and therefore, you know, as you um, increase temperature, you, you start from here and you just start populating these states here. And so your, your contact just goes down. Does that make sense? Uh, but uh, okay, I think for for mobile impurity, you also have kind of orthogonality catastrophe, and for infinite mass, you can also have uh, this uh, bound state. So um, it's not clear right now, okay. but uh, so in this particular it. scenario where I have just a single impurity in a in a Fermi gas um, interacting with short range interactions, mm -hmm. then I have this orthogonality catastrophe where the, uh, if I have, sorry, if I have infinitely heavy impurity, I have orthogonality catastrophe where the um, quasi-particle residue goes to zero. And, you know, I, I don't have the concept of, of uh, you know, I will define quasi-particle. I really start by having a, a continuum like a power law singularity in my spectrum. Whereas if I have, a finite impurity mass, then I have this attractive polaron state that peels off from the continuum. This is this is a, essentially a spectral gap in the sense that it's exponentially suppressed, but it's not actually it's, it's not a complete suppression of spectral weight. It's just a sorry. Right, but but, but but your main statement, if if I understand it correctly, is that uh, for a positive case uh, for mobile impurity. Uh, you basically uh, don't have orthogonality catastrophe, is it right? Yes, yes. Oh, great. So my impurity and the fermions have uh, short range attractive interactions, I should say. So, um, yes, so I have attractive, the underlying attract, interaction between my impurity and the medium is, is attractive. And that's why I have these, as I, increase my attraction in the system, my polaron energy goes down like this. So it becomes tighter and tighter bound to the medium.
Okay, so maybe let me continue um, the last two minutes of my talk. Um, maybe I'll go a little bit over time because Miro stole my time. Anyway, um, so, uh, so what I wanted to talk about just briefly here the last few minutes is the repulsive polarant branch. So most of the physics that I've been discussing uh, related to the contact and the free energy was de determined by this regime here. But we also have this repulsive branch, and this has been studied in, in several experiments. And uh, for instance, here's a, a plot of uh, an injection spectrum um, from uh, the group at LMU. Um, so, and they're both 3D and, and 2D experiments. Now, you know, I was saying that possibly you can probe these kind of spectral features or, or the, the nature of these peaks in your spectrum by using, uh, by driving Rabi oscillations. And, um, and these Rabi oscillations um, were indeed observed both in a 3D experiment at Lens and a 2D experiment at LMU. And, um, and they look as follows here. So we have weak interactions on the left and going towards stronger interactions on the right for both cases. And this, this blue line here uh, corresponds to our variational time dependent uh, theory. And, and we see that we have very, very good agreement with, between the experiment and the theory without any fitting parameters in the system. And now we can ask from, from this kind of spectrum here, can we learn something about the nature of the, of the repulsive polaron? So we are really driving the, uh, the oscillations right on the repulsive polarized peak. Um, and indeed, we can learn something. So what we, what we do is we extract the damping of these oscillations here. Um, so I'll remind you that these Rabi oscillations, they have a shifted frequency and they have some overall exponential damping. And now what we do is we extract the damping, uh, both in experiment, which are these black symbols here, and in our theory, which are these blue symbols here. And um, these error bars here just signal what is the range of, uh, of possible Fermi energies because of the uncertainty in, in the experiment. So that's why the theory also has an, uh, an error bar. And so we extract these uh, decay, uh, the stamping here, both in experiment and in theory. And we see that we have a very good agreement in 2D and also in 3D, although at, in 3D at the very large interactions, um, there is some difference between the results. And then we compare it with the following theory line. So this green line here is um, the width of the repulsive polaron calculated within, again, our variational method. Um, but so it's, it's not time dependent. It's not a time dependent calculation. It's really just calculating the spectral width of this feature. And again, we see that that spectral width here uh, matches very nicely with the damping. And now um, what's remarkable about this result here is that our, um, this calculation, this green line here, uh, where we calculate the spectral width, does not contain any decay channels from the repulsive polaron to the attractive polaron, because that requires multiple particle hole pairs in order to be able to describe the, the, the recoil in this system. And so what this means is that really the, the, um, the lifetime of the repulsive polaron is really dominated um, by whatever it is that leads to uh, this width here, the screen line here. And what we will argue is that this here is actually a many body defacing um, phenomenon rather than uh, some sort of relaxation from the repulsive to the attractive branch. So the physics is as follows. So if you have um, as you increase your interaction um, of your repulsive branch, so now the scattering length here is positive here, I increase it from weak interactions towards stronger interactions like this here, 
Um, what I have is I have my energy here has this kind of mean field form. It's uh, linear in, in scattering length, and the next order is, is quadratic and so on. And what happens is actually that this, the act of, of having this mean field energy shift actually pushes this polaron energy up into the scattering continuum. And so what you can calculate is this uh, decay rate here. What you find is that the decay rate in this system here actually scales like a to the fourth power. Um, and sorry, th this decay rate here is, is really the, sorry, I should say that's the width of, of the repulsive polaron. Okay. Now you can also calculate the relaxation rate from this repulsive polaron branch to the attractive branch. And this was done by Petrov almost 20 years ago. And this scales like a to the sixth power. So we clearly see that there's, at least for weak interactions, there's a clear separation of scales where this many body defacing um, is much more important in the weak interaction limit than this kind of relaxation process here. And now, of course, as you go to very strong interactions, then they will tend towards the same kind of order of magnitude just set by the Fermi energy. But at least for weak interactions, we can see that this is a well-defined quasi-particle where the width is much smaller than the energy itself. And, uh, and it does not relax to, to this lower lying state. Yes, Bob? Yes, sorry. Can I ask a question? Yes. Is this the zero momentum repulsive polaron? Yes, this is all zero momentum, yes. So what does it decay to in terms of defacing? What is the scattering? So it's, it's really because it sits in a, in a scattering continuum. So it's really, you know, that it's it effectively, it's like a, well, it is a coupling of a discrete level to a continuum. Yeah, but what is the continuum? Well, it's the, the scattering continuum of two particles of the impurity and, and one of the medium particles. Yeah, but I think this calculation, you're assuming then that the scattering, you have a repulsive polaron and then it creates a particle hole and then it, uh, it moves in another direction, but it stays in the, you know, this is, uh, you're assuming this, that the, uh, let me just, uh, you're assuming this, that the impurity, outgoing impurity in the scattering process is free. Right. No, no, no. So, so this process because here because otherwise, is otherwise the otherwise the, the repulsive polaron doesn't have any. It's a ground state for zero temp for zero momentum. It cannot scatter into any other. You see, yes, but it can create still a be, particle it, hole excitation, and then then the repulsive polaron moves in another direction. But it's the repulsive polaron. It's not a free particle. Okay. What I should say here is that. Um, of course, this is not the ground state. And, uh, but in fact, at, at this level of the theory, it, it does not know that there's a lower lying state, right? So, so here, this could equally well be, be um, some actual repulsive interactions. It doesn't realize that the interactions are not repulsive until this order here. But yes, I should say it's a zero momentum uh, repulsive polaron. This gamma here corresponds to the imaginary part of the self energy. Yeah, but and this you, imaginary you, part of the self energy comes because we have coupled our many body, or, uh, you know, our polaron to this continuum of scattering states. Yes, but the continuum of the scattering states, if, if I mean, if you were more technical, if you do a self consistent calculation, so then the continuum of scattering states will be the polaron moving in one direction, but it's still a repulsive polaron, which will have a higher energy than the repulsive polaron at zero momentum, plus a particle hole excitation, which also costs energy. So you cannot get any decay. You cannot get, uh, it's off resonant. The repulsive polaron is a ground state of, for zero momentum doesn't, you cannot get an imaginary part from it scattering into other repulsive polaron states because that all those scattering processes cost energy. Yes, but what I'm trying to say that it, it has an intrinsic broadening simply because it is, you know, it is scattering. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a superposition uh, uh, state where this, this impurity can, can scatter uh, with all these particles in the medium. And it does so at a particular energy, 
which sits inside a continuum. And in, anytime you couple, uh, you know, a, a discrete spectral line to some continuum of states, what, what, what is this continuum? What are this? What is this continuum of states? It's just relative motion of the impurity and and uh, and the fermions. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. So then, uh, but maybe we can discuss afterwards. If the impurity is, is so, this continuum you create out of having the impurity having some momentum, and then you have a particle hole excitation so that the total momentum is zero. Both yes, but these, yes, uh, important both these uh, states uh, cost energy compared to the zero momentum repulsive polar run. So the repulsive polar run at zero momentum is not sitting inside a continuum. That, that's what I don't understand. If you do a self-consistent calculation, so this, you say the scattering states are also, the exit states of the impurity are also repulsive polar run states, then you'll find that all the exit states for a zero momentum polar on will have higher energy because you have to give kinetic energy to the exit repulsive polar on state. Plus you have to create a particle hole excitation. Both these things uh, cost energy. So it's not sitting inside a continuum. No, what I'm saying is, it's, well, uh, okay, I see there's something in the chat. Yeah, yeah, it's not the ground state, yes. but it's, it's so, so, but the, the states that are the repulsive polar run for zero momentum, it has a continuum states above it, but it, and, and then it has molecular states no, no, below no. and has attractive, but it doesn't have any scattering no, but, state that, that involves the repulsive polar run going out. It's not, but it's, uh, not, it's not the repulsive polar run itself that's scattering, it's the impurity that's inside the repulsive polar run, right? But uh, yeah, but it's it's the, maybe you can discuss, but it's the eigenstates. I mean, you have uh, what are the eigenstates you scatter into? Well, it's uh, oops, Did I... okay, is it still running? Yes, we hear you. Okay, sorry, my screen just froze. Let me just, but we don't see your screen, and now it's not. Okay, sorry, this is getting very late, um, but I, <laughs> um, so, so the idea is that, I think the difference in, in the pictures that we have is, uh, so I'm saying that the repulsive polaron is something that has an intrinsic width, because it's really like, it's a, you can think of it as a discrete level that's coupled to a continuum. I think you know, you're thinking of it as something that starts at some particular energy, and then it has um, some continuum after that energy. Is that fair to say? It's getting me, I'm sorry, but I'm just thinking like a golden rule calculation. You can do like, what can it scatter into? You need some exit states that are on resonance, right? With, with the, if you have a repulsive polar on at zero momentum and you need some, what is the continuum? You have, some, have to have some continuum states like what you've drawn there. And I'm just not sure where does this continuum states come from? If you do, if you assume that it's a plane wave impurity state going one direction and a particle hole in the other, you know, to, to, to compensate for the momentum, yes, then you get this result. But if you then say, but well, actually the outgoing polaron impurity is also in a polaronic state, repulsive polaronic state, then you'll find that all these energies, they move up, you, you move the continuum up. So said, said diagrammatically, if you do a self-consistent impure, if you put self-consistent Green's functions inside your diagrams, you'll find that these scattering processes uh, are all, they all cost energy. So they don't lead to any kind of uh, uh, on-shell decay, I guess, what we can discuss later. Yeah, okay. This, this maybe, is, maybe I guess I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll just point out that this is this line here that fits extremely well with the experimental data. But of course, that's not necessarily a proof, but um, yes. Okay, anyway, let's, let's discuss this later. Um, all right, so this is the end of the talk. Um, so I've talked about different probes of the Fermi Polaron uh, these various spectroscopic uh, uh, protocols and how they're related in the, in the limit of a single impurity. 
And I've discussed Rabi oscillations, which is also a probe of, of uh, essentially the, the nature of the Fermi polaron. Um, so I just want to highlight that we have this temperature dependence uh, of the contact and how this signals this underlying uh, impurity transition from this polaronic state to the molecule state. Um, and uh, then again, I want to emphasize that we are thinking of this repulsive branch, uh, the, the width in this as being dominated by many body defacing rather than relaxation to uh, deeper lying states. So uh, with that, uh, I'll show this uh, group photo from our group again. And um, most of this work here was done by a Hayden Atlan a student and a postdoc Wei Shidio, and also by Zhou Yuxi, who has since moved to Shanghai. And I should, of course, also thank our experimental collaborators. So thanks. Those who survive, questions. Oh no. Nobody wants to ask anything. Okay, I can ask something. So uh, what about this discrepancy in your unitarity between theory and the experiment? Uh, do you have some comment about that? Um, ah. In this regime here, yeah. Um, yes, so that that's that's a good question. Um, I should say that uh, even extracting this decay in uh, or the damping in this regime here becomes quite complicated, because so the the experimental look, data looks somewhat like something like this here, um, and well, obviously. I mean, this is maybe suggestive of some oscillations, but uh, really fitting a damped uh, oscillation to this this data or even to our theory becomes quite complicated, um, simply because of the the spectrum in this regime. So I think it's it's really mainly due to that. I see. So so basically, the repulsive polaron is maybe not very well defined anymore. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. If we don't have questions, we thank speaker for the bravery, courage, and staying with us in this difficult Australian time. And uh, yeah. I already learned that you are uh, clapping instead of asking questions. Yes, Gio, thanks. Uh, yeah. I stop recording first. Ah, so wait, I, in chat. Yeah, so, okay, I, I, I see this little discussion, continuation discussion in chat. So I, I clicked save chat. You will get it. And uh, I stop recording. Talk.